went into this lab. Uh, kind of like the most reverse engineering we'll be doing this class. Since, like I said, I didn't want to make reverse engineering a prerequisite to this class. But invariably, when you're doing a Windows exploit development, you're going to have to do some reverse engineering to figure out why the program is crashing, where it's crashing, what it's trying to do. Just at the point where your exploit is trying to run. It will also come in handy when we're um, analyzing crash dumps to see if they're exploitable or not. Just to have, you know, a little bit of reverse engineering chops. But in case the, uh, the term reverse engineering scares you, if you have no experience with this, you can just relabel it debugging. That's what we're really just doing is using our debugger try to figure out what's going on. So I'll, uh, let me see, I'll fire this thing up in a debug session. Oops. Uh, if I was doing this, what I would be thinking about, if I had no prior knowledge at all this program was doing. So looking at this, what do we think the first few lines of the program are doing? We see like push EBP, move EBP, ESP, which is like hey, Corey, the standard can make the text prologue, again? right? Oh yeah, yeah. Better? So looking at this, guys, this is the very beginning of the main function for mystery. It's the first few uh, x86 instructions to execute. What do we, uh, you know, have a general idea of what's happening here? In fact, before we even try to speculate about higher level reasoning about what it's doing, let's just try to step through it, get a feel for what's happening. So I'm just going to single step, see what happens. Okay, here it's comparing a value. And then if it's equal, it's going to jump somewhere, otherwise it's going to do something else. Um, Whenever I see something like this, when I'm reversing something and I see a value, okay, what is it comparing? Just looking at that, does anyone know what that is? What? Yeah, right ballpark. Can you, can you tell me exactly what argument it is? So everything below EDP is like a local stack variable, and above EDP, generally in x86, is an uh, argument to the function. So, Sam is right. Um, EBP plus 8, in this case, is argc, which is the number of command line arguments passed to the program. Assuming I didn't know that, I would just want to check out what that is. It's 1. Okay. If I didn't know it was argc, I would, you know, kind of like, okay, that's 1. Just make a note of that. T, 1 is not equal to 3. So we're not going to take that jump. It's pushing something on the stack. I was going to call print F. Now I want to see uh, what it just pushed onto the stack, which is, I know is what it's going to print at. And what I did here was the DA command, which is described as an ASCII string, you know, so like uh, look at this pointer and try to display this string. So what this is going to do is it's going to uh, print this message that we've been seeing on the command line. It's so, okay, I mean, 
maybe or maybe not vulnerable code follows after that. Well, let's just see where the program goes. Oops. Didn't want to step into the printf function. Not interested in that. Okay, so we called printf, and it's you know cleaning up the stack. Looks like it's setting a um, return value, jumping somewhere. There's leaving the main function. So the way it's executing right now, it's not doing anything. It's just printing a message and then exiting. So there's um, no vulnerability there. So that was like a binary decision. We binary branch we took there either. Uh, if they compare EBV plus 8, either jump or don't jump at this point, we executed this. So obviously, that isn't doing anything interesting. So we want EBP plus 8 to be equal to whatever it was comparing against, 3. So for it to do anything interesting to expand our code coverage, we have to um, make that compare evaluate true. So there's a hint number one for you guys. All the suffering, the pain train continue for a while. Based on this code, if the uh, compare evaluates is true, looks like we'll call this function, whatever it is, mystery function plus something. So I would want to look in this function and see what's going on there. Those of you that did the bomb lab like 10,000 times should be going through this, right? So while you guys are working on this, I just want to. Um, bring up a high level point. We can see right here that um, one thing we already had to deal with was we are comparing this value EBP plus 8 to 3 and then if this compare didn't work out we basically exited immediately. If we were developing a vulnerability and we discovered that or we were developing an exploit for vulnerability we discovered that EBP was some value that we controlled EBP plus 8, let's assume it's like EBP minus something and it's a local stack variable that we're approaching under payload. We would know that, okay, well, if this compare doesn't check out, then the, the function is kind of exit, and we're never going to actually ex, you know, do that vulnerability and corrupt the uh, process. So I have to make sure that that is, um, that this particular part of my payload is 3, that way the process continues execution. Um, and you always have to keep in mind these kind of constraints that are going to be placed on your payload. Like whatever part of my payload is overriding this has to be equal to 3. And in general when we're reversing um, or fuzzing, we want to increase what's called code coverage. So in this case if EBP plus 8 is not equal to 3, our code coverage is very poor. That's just going to fail this compare and print a message and exit out completely. And um, the more code that executes, the more potential uh, bugs or vulnerabilities you're going to step over. So you just want more code to execute. So for instance, in this case, I'm going to sort of draw like a IDA pro uh, kind of block diagram that represents a program. This is something I'll talk about again when we're um, talking about fuzzing. But let's say this is our entry point in domain, or in general, any type of program that we're trying to exploit. 
And right here it's doing the um, compare, you know, I'm just going to say RC because you know that's what it is. Can uh, the remote people read this okay? Uh, if Bill, could you zoom in a little bit on that? that that's good, thanks. Yeah, that's good. So in this case, you know, we have like this Ida Pro block diagram and this compare RC. And if the compare RC fails, we're going to pick this, which is basically just, you know, exit program. So right now, if RC is not three, we're just taking this path. But when we're fuzzing, we want to explore as many paths as possible because uh, the more code you step over, the more code you look at, the more code you touch, the more bugs you're going to hit. So if there's a bug down here in this Ida Pro block, and over here in this one, we would never be seeing them because that compare doesn't um, work out. They just exit immediately. So when we're fuzzing, for instance, we want to be aware of this, that if this value isn't equal to this, we're just going to exit it immediately. And we want to uh, make sure that we're hitting all the constraints properly, we're generating constraints properly so that we end up iterating over these blocks next to these blocks as well. So eventually we'll hit these vulnerable blocks of code that contain vulnerable calls like all step sprintf or string copy or mem copy or scanf and hopefully get a crash. So um, talk about this again in the context of fuzzing later on, but in general, vulnerability discovery, exploit development, you have to figure out what these constraints are on your payload and your data and figure out how to best expand code coverage so you can hopefully get these vulnerable blocks. So in this case, if arcs equals 3, we're going to in this branch and then hopefully something good will happen as we continue execution down this branch in the mystery program. So I'll just sort of uh, work through this a little bit more, try to step through the process for anyone that's confused at this point. So, okay, I know that uh, argc has to be three, which means I need to pass it two additional arguments, right? It's kind of the weird little gotcha there. Let's uh, step again. So I hit the jump this time. I'm excited. We're executing code that we have never executed before. We are on the new frontier. Hopefully one full of strange people and awesome vulnerabilities. And okay, we're going to call this function. And since I've not been in it before, I definitely want to step into it. So I'm going to do T for step into. I jump through some of my relocation tables here. Nothing too interesting. And okay, we're just executing a function. So, when I'm looking for vulnerabilities, whenever I see some tracking like a large amount of ESP, that usually kind of um, spikes my curiosity because this usually means I've been doing a lot of stuff with local variables. Whenever there's a lot of local variables flying around, that also means there might be a vulnerability there. So I'm like, okay, well, this function uh, might be worth looking at. Um, another important part of reversing, I want to say, is that knowing like what not to worry about or what not to analyze is like equally as important as knowing what to analyze. So if this function was just like five instructions here and then returned, I would like. I don't even want to waste my time with this. I'm just going to step out of this and then make a note that mystery, mystery function or whatever the address of the function is at is, isn't worth my time. Not interesting so that whenever I see that 
function be called again. I know just to step over it and not even bother stepping into it. But in this case, got a lot of stack variables getting allocated, uh, stuff going on. So, yeah, okay, I'll take a look at this thing. Okay, so, all right, setting some local variable equal to zero. Another local variable equal to zero. Jumping somewhere, okay, well, we got to take that jump, so I may as well step into the jump. Okay, another compare. Um, I'm thinking as an attacker, is EVP minus four something that I control? We know right away that we might not know this, we might have to inspect it and sort of reason about whether or not it's something we control. In this case, we know that it's not because we see right up here that um, EVP minus four is initialized to zero. So, okay. Interesting. So we know that uh, this compares, you know, kind of fail, jump greater than or equal to. So zero is less than 80 and X, so we're not going to take that jump. I'm assuming that this is a loop of some kind. Yeah, exactly. You have ECX, EBD minus 4, so I just kind of go ahead and assume when I see EBD minus 4 that's like I or iterator, some type of like iterator value, okay, whatever. Alright, I don't know what's going on here. It's like moving some data somewhere. Okay, one thing that um, I'm making note of mentally here when I'm looking at this is that none of this so far seems to be operating on my data. So at this point, the only data of ours that's entered into the program apparently is those command line arguments. We know that it's comparing to make sure that we have uh, two additional command line arguments. But I know it's not using any of those because it's doing like um, looking at stack variables. I don't see any like EVP plus four or eight or whatever. Um, this is doing EVP plus but immediately minus 490. So. It's probably indexing off some array, what I would guess here. So, okay, so this loop doesn't appear to be touching our data so far. All right, it's like moving a byte value, doing something. Still not touching our data. It's still just messing with these local variables that we have no control over. Okay, now it's adding one to our iterator. It's kind of like go through this loop again. So, what I would do. If I'm trying to exploit this program, I would think, all right, we have a loop here. It looks like the only exit out of this loop is this jump greater than or equal. So the only way this loop is ever going to exit is when the iterator equals 80. It looks like that's just being monotonically uh, increased. So, okay, I just have like a simple loop here. It's not even like touching any of my data. And I know that eventually it's just going to exit and then continue the execution of the function. So what I would do is I would say, I don't even care about this loop because it's not operating on my data. As an exploit developer, we really only care about, or we generally only care about the functions that are operating on our data, operating what's in this, the tainted data, sources of attacker input, because those are the things we can control and try to leverage to corrupt the program. In this case, we don't control really any of the components of this loop for any of the components in this block of code, so. Yeah, so Sam, Sam asked, did this function even have any parameters? Well, you can, you can answer that. 
how would how would you answer that question? X86. You would look at the call, see if anything was pushed onto the stack before the call. At this point, it looks like the only tainted attacker data that's even entered into the program has been those two command line arguments. And they weren't even seemingly passed to this function, so you know, it looks like at this point our data, any attacker controlled data, isn't even influencing the process at all. So I really don't even care about this stuff right now. So what I would do is, okay, oops, where does this function end? All right, compare jump greater than or equal to, where am I going to? 401072. All right, right here. I can just do run the cursor. So I'm like, okay, that loop was not interesting. Um, it was like, looking at some stat local variables that I don't control, looping over them and exiting a loop um, deterministically. So, get past it, keep reversing, that will be my thought process. Just remember, when you're looking for these bugs, trying to develop exploits, you're really only interested in focusing on the code that is operating on your attacker controlled data. or influencing it in some way. Aha! Uh -huh. The center of power. So I want to take a class poll and see what you guys want to do about lunch. Uh, what time is everyone feeling, uh, feeling like for lunch? I think it should depend basically on where you're at with the labs at the time. Ideally, you want to stop when you've got a lab. So, so what I did in uh, exploit in, uh, in McLean was that I, I think I stopped around like 11:15, and I just said that we we're going to continue working on this lab over lunch, um, so that people were welcome to keep working on this over lunch. Yep, they that seems to. good. So. Um, yeah, okay. So we'll aim for around like 11.15 for like a one hour lunch, but I um, want to get you guys to uh, the next step at least before I cut you guys loose for that. Also, Sam, if you use DC, I think even DB will tell you. But um, DC will tell you like the uh, the bytes as well as like their ASCII representation. As will DB. Yeah, I think it's all. I think even DU will describe it as like a unicode strain or something. Yeah. I don't think we uh, I think I'd have to might touch unicode in this class, so it's kind of one to keep in your bag of tricks.
So after this lab is over, we'll kind of officially finish the uh, review part and transition part of the class where you take what you know from exploits one and figure out how to apply it to exploits two. And then uh, we'll start talking about some more new specific topics that will be uh, new to you guys, like exception handler overrides. That's what we'll talk about today. And that'll be another target that we override on the stack besides the return address, which is actually a, generally a better target than this. For anyone racing ahead in the lab, the ultimate goal is to get the calculator shell code to execute. So if you're way ahead of where I'm at in my walkthrough here, please continue in that direction. So what I would do here, let's continue my walkthrough. If you want to continue at your own pace, please close your ears and avert your eyes. I'm like, okay, I see an F open call coming up. I know I'm going to execute it because there's no branching instructions between where I'm at and where it is. So, okay, let's see what it's trying to open. All right, I saw two things pushed onto the stack. So, um, it's trying to two arguments for the F open call. I'll do a DB first argument. Okay, so the first argument appears to be the string c colon slash hello there dot bin and I'll terminate it. So it's trying to open a hard coded file. And this looks like this path is probably just hard coded in the program because it wasn't passed as an argument into the um, into the function. We can see it's even coming from like a static region of memory, so it's probably some like a hard coded constant. And there's another argument pushed on there, which I know is just uh, you know, the mode you want to open the file in. So R interesting. So it's opening a file for reading. It's hard coded. Um, Let's see what's uh, okay. It's trying to open hello there dot bin, which doesn't even appear to exist. So, all right, let's see what what happens. Step over the call with echo button and look at it. Okay, at this context, at this point in the program's execution, what does EAX signify? The return code for the function. So, all right, zero. And what I could do if I had access to the, the internet is I could look up the f open function call and see what the return code is supposed to be. Now I would see that in this case, zero null indicates like a failed value, failed, you know, no, no good, failed, failed to open. This is surprising since the file wasn't even there. So it's going to compare the return value to zero. Um, it's not going to take this jump. And one useful thing about WinDebug is it's telling you right here that the branch will not be taken, branch equals zero. So, okay, it's going to do a printf call. Not this damn message again. Oops. Uh, okay. It's a call function, is that right? Okay, so yeah, it's going to call printf. Prints out this message again. It's an annoying message. And I want to see what else it does. So it's over printf. 
speed, you can jump unconditionally, and then just exit. So, once again, this doesn't do anything interesting. In this case, it's doing something like Bill, can I um, get the board here on the screen for a sec? So, assuming this is like kind of a block diagram for what Mystery is doing. Here, we'll say that this calls mystery function. So, out of the way in a second for those of you that can't see. So if hello there dot bin doesn't exist, it just returns immediately and then it's going to go back up and just Exit immediately, basically, so not too interesting. So we know for sure that hello, we want hello there not been to exist. Then file. Step past the loop. Let's jump right to this F open call actually. Step over F open. Okay, this time EAX is not null value, so F open succeeded obviously since I just created a file. Alright, so now we're in the new territory. This is code we're going to execute. Hey Corey, can you step up to the F read and like show what's on your stack? Because mine is uh, erroring out in the F read itself. Actually, it's like getting an access violation, but the parameters look fine to me. Yeah, ah, yeah. So, so, you know what you're doing is you're putting so much data into the file that you're um, writing past the balance of the stack. And no, I checked it. So, I I confirmed that the it's. It's not, it's like the register values in the, there's like a rep move s that it's hitting and the EDI and ESI are messed up kind of thing. So I had tried with too little and I had tried with too much, but it's either way it's erroring out in the uh, inside F read. Okay. Um. So I just want to see what the, what the values are on your stack to make sure they're the same thing as mine. Yeah, yeah. So what I'll do is I'll try to step over the call too and see if I get an error. Get the error you're seeing. So what I've found, you know, sometimes is that um, 
sometimes updating the file in HXD or whatever, if you do like a dot restart, it'll still like use the old file for whatever reason. So you might have to like uh, restart WinDebug or just look with like a DD command on that. Uh, I guess yeah, it'll be hard to tell. If, if you keep track of where your buffer is located on the stack at the time where the uh, the mem the free crashes, you can look at uh, that buffer again to make sure it contains your uh, new updated smaller payload. Because what I suspect is happening is that when you do the .restart, it still reuse the old file that was too big. Yeah, I wasn't actually doing dot .restart. I was closing WinDebug between each one, so that's fine. Really? I'll, I'll maybe, maybe it was that, maybe it was that it was too big, and I'll, I'll cut it back down to the size I think it should be. But I kicked it up to the hex 800 ish, but we'll see. Yeah. So. Um, So as you see here, uh, it sounded like the same vulnerability. You saw it's going to do an fread call. The hello there.bin file is a file that we can create and control. So it contains our data. We're calling fread. Um, fread is reading in, oh, it's 800 bytes. But the buffer is at most OX 408 bytes. And I can tell that just because EB, it's setting EVP minus 408. And once it gets to EVP minus zero, it's going to be overriding on save frame pointer. So after 408 bytes, we're going to be overriding uh, good stuff like the save frame pointer and the return address. But here's the gotcha that I want you guys to be aware of. You should only write enough to overwrite the return address. Because if you write too much past that, you're going to crash the program. The reason being, FREED will continue to try to read in data and write it to the stack. And eventually, it will be trying to write data past the boundaries of the stack. And that it will just crash when it tries to do that before it even uses that corrupt return address. So Corey, that was one of my theories on my bug. But if you, set, if you go to that um, EBP minus 408 address that you do and you do a so basically do like a DD EBP minus 408 plus 800 and that still seemed to be a valid address it wasn't like that it was off the end of the stack right see it's still within range I mean it's possible that it's I suppose it could be, uh, yeah, actually that may be what it is. It's off the stack as far as Windows is concerned in terms of uh, yeah. accessible area, right. but WinDebug can yeah, access it. Yeah, it could be writing into like a non-writable region or something like that. Yeah, that's probably Because what generally is. what you'll see in this class is if you see stack addresses at 12FF70, that means the limits of your stack is going to be 130000. As soon as it tries to write a value there, it's going to crash. So you, if you use the bang address commands, you know, on 1300, you'll see as soon as you get to 1300, it's uh, read only. Yep, that's what it was then. So it was, I was just checking with that, and I should have just cut it back. So remember, we're all about science and precision here. We want to overwrite the return address explicitly and nothing afterwards. In general, when you're developing an exploit, you want to corrupt as little of the process as necessary because you want the process to live long enough to execute your payload. If you go and just destroy a whole bunch of stuff on the stack, it's possible that you will cause the application to crash before it even gets to the point where you control EIP and can execute your shell code. So you always want to aim for the minimal corruption necessary. After lunch is over, we will focus on writing past, writing past the um, the return address and writing other juicy things up further on the stack.
Veronica just made a suggestion that being 10 1, you know, will tell you that basically what this thing is 1300 with the stack, stack rolling down. As soon as you're writing above 1300, you're kind of like off the limits of the stack and you're going to get that exception. So what I'm going to do now, guys, is we can break for lunch. Um, you guys should hopefully know how to get to the point in the mystery program's execution where it's reading in attacker data, getting to a vulnerability. So I'm going to say we'll do lunch until 12.15, so you're free to go until then. Uh, we will continue working on this a little bit uh, after we get back from lunch, because I want people to get calculators popping up on their computer on this one. And then once we are done with that, we'll talk about overriding exception handlers, which are stored above recurrent addresses on the stack, and actually provide kind of a juicier target for uh, buffer overflows in the Windows environment. All right, so you guys feel free to uh, take off or stay here and work, but we'll uh, reconvene at um, 12.15.